it strikes from thunderclouds or a clear blue sky. It can paralyze and it can kill. Lightning. Lightning strikes somewhere on the Earth's surface a hundred times every second. In the U.S. alone, there are over 20 million lightning strikes every year, generating enough current to light four billion homes. Nothing can stop it. Lightning looks for the quickest route to the Earth's surface. It will use trees, buildings, and people in its desperate attempt to reach the ground. Since record keeping began in 1940, lightning has been responsible for over 8,000 deaths. Incredibly, some victims survive. We have recreated some remarkable stories of survival against one of the world's deadliest natural phenomena. Scott Severn and Joe Swedorsky were serving with the 438th Field Artillery Battalion, U.S. Army Reserve. 21-year-old Scott had joined four years earlier. Any chance you could sneak us back to camp in this truck, sir? Wish I could, boys. Keep your eyes open. Yes, sir. It's August 14th, 1989, and the battalion is on annual training at Camp Grady in Michigan. Scott and Joe Swedorsky take up their sentry positions at the entrance to the camp's tactical operations center. Take it easy. A storm has been brewing all day, and now it unleashes its full force on the camp. This type of weather is not unusual in Michigan, and the soldiers are used to it. They're not surprised when the commanding officer gives the order to remove all metal objects in accordance with standard army safety procedures. We'll go. Joe, drop your metal. For Scott, the order comes too late. A bolt of lightning strikes him on the head causing his poncho to melt and his dog tags to weld together. The intense heat makes his skin boil. The lightning leaps from Scott striking his field radio. It travels down the wires and explodes into the tactical operations center. Scott is flung 20 feet in the air. A ring of fire ignites where he was standing. Joe Swidorski realizes something has happened, but all he can see are the flames. Scott has disappeared. Somebody help! help! He panics and runs for help. Come here, I need you two to go up to the battery and find out if there's any damage to the gun. Let's go. Colonel! Colonel! It's Scott! Joe still hasn't realized what's happened when he reaches the tactical operations center. Chief Warrant Officer John Schettoni tries to calm him. Troops are immediately dispatched to search for Scott. Go, yes. radio for medic and ambulance. Yes, sir. 
Warrant Officer Scatoni right. follows on foot. Scatoni arrives. The search party is administering cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, in an attempt to get Scott's heart beating again. He's not responding. Scatoni takes over. Brendan, let me do this. Years earlier, his son's best friend collapsed while playing football. Scatoni rushed onto the field to help. As he administered CPR, the 16-year-old boy died. Scatoni was determined this would not happen again. After 30 minutes, there is still no response. Scatoni does not give up. 40 minutes later, Scott finally starts to respond. He's got a pulse. He's got to get him to an ambulance. With Scott showing signs of life, his rescuers know they have to get him to a hospital if he's to have any chance of survival. The severe weather is causing havoc with the emergency services. No ambulance can get to the scene of the accident. Scott is loaded onto the back of a Humvee and driven at high speed to the nearest interstate highway, where they hope an ambulance is there to meet them. Scott, come on, Scott, hang in with me, buddy. Come on, buddy, hang on, we're almost there. Come on, Scott. Suddenly, Scott's heart stops beating, but again, they revive him. Two, three, four. When they get to the interstate highway, the ambulance is nowhere to be seen. Not right here. Take us straight to the hospital now. Let's go, let's go. Scott is in critical condition. His eardrums have burst, and he's suffering third-degree burns over 30% of his body. All right, our pulse is 57. With no sign of brain activity, it's beginning to look as if Scott is not going to make it. EEG shows no activity at all. Pulse is negligible. I think we need to get a hold of this family and see if he's a donor. The staff begins the grim task of preparing his death certificate. With Scott now at death's door, the Army insists on flying him to the University of Michigan Hospital, where more advanced facilities are available. On arrival, he's given less than a 5% chance of survival. His right leg has now become so swollen that the doctors fear his blood circulation could stop at any moment. They perform an emergency operation to relieve the pressure. On the second day after the lightning strike, Scott starts showing signs of brain activity. Miraculously, a scan shows a completely normal brainwave pattern. Four days later, Scott briefly regains consciousness. But now he has to be heavily sedated and placed under restraint to prevent him from injuring himself. Okay, take your four rounds up. All right, you're in the hospital. We're gonna be taking care of you. Take it easy now. After 17 days on a respirator, Scott pulls out his own throat tube and starts to breathe unaided. Start taking some of these things off of you, 
okay. he is taken off drugs and begins an extensive course of physiotherapy. Three months after being struck by lightning, Scott Severn is released from the hospital. I'm considered a quadriplegic. I don't have any use in my legs. Uh, both my hands are weak, uh, my left being a lot weaker than my right. About the most annoying thing is probably a constant ringing in my ears. Uh, both of my eardrums are blown out. Uh, one of them healed, healed with scar tissue and the other one was surgically repaired. Scott suffered the worst type of strike. His body took the full impact of the lightning bolt. The lightning was a direct hit. It went in my helmet right here. Entered behind my, behind my ear. Uh, went down, a lot of it goes across the surface of the body, some of it, some of the electricity would go down through the nerves. More than 100,000 volts shot through Scott's body. How did he survive this massive shock to his system? One of the reasons that people think that lightning is going to just turn the person into a little pile of ashes is because there is so much tremendous energy voltage and amperage with lightning. However, the physics of lightning is tremendously different than high voltage. If you're holding onto a high voltage line and got the same apparent voltage and amperage, yes, you probably would be um, uh, burned tremendously. With lightning, because it's so incredibly short, like a millisecond or maybe even as little as a tenth of a millisecond, the lightning really seldom has a chance to actually burn through the uh, skin and go internally like that high voltage energy does. Although lightning usually travels too fast to burn the internal organs, the huge charge of electricity can still be a killer. The research that we've done shows that the only thing that kills a person from lightning is the cardiac arrest. Lightning acts like a cosmic defibrillator, if you will. It stops the heart and stops it cold for a small period of time. But then the pacemaker that's at the top of the heart starts beating again so that you have the heartbeat coming back, but the respiratory arrest is considerably longer and more severe than the cardiac arrest. As a result, then you get a secondary cardiac arrest from the lack of oxygen, from the lack of breathing. It is this second cardiac arrest which causes most lightning strike fatalities. When the heart stops, it is essential to resuscitate the victim as quickly as possible. Lives have been lost because of the mistaken belief that the victim is still electrically charged. CPR should be started immediately and must be kept up for at least 45 minutes, even if there is no sign of life. The heart can be still for over half an hour and then suddenly start again. One of the officers, uh, John Scatone, said that he looked at me and saw his son somehow and would not give up. There's many things that we don't understand about the cardiac arrest with lightning, so that I would continue to resuscitate the person. Generally, though, anyone who's had a prolonged period of cardiac arrest like that is going to end up with permanent damage. And Scott was just particularly lucky that he didn't have permanent nerve or brain damage as a result of his prolonged arrest. Scott's case is unusual. The lightning did not permanently damage his nervous system, and scientists still cannot explain why he is unable to walk. Confusion and amnesia tend to be the most common symptoms suffered by people who've been hit by lightning. Victims rarely remember the moment they're hit. Sometimes whole sections of their lives are erased from their memory. Physical effects include cataracts, blindness, deafness, and permanent nerve damage. It is also thought that lightning strike victims may be susceptible to infections, heart problems, and even cancer, brought on by damage to the immune system. Most also suffer first and second degree skin burns. But the physical effects are only the beginning. The vast majority of people who are hit by lightning live. Unfortunately, there's a percentage of them who have permanent problems. One of the major problems that we see with the lightning victim is that they're no longer the same person that they were before they were hit. So they have to get used to who this new person is within them, if you will. 
Now that sounds a little um, science fiction-y or something like that, but actually what it is is the same type of personality changes that you see with a blunt head injury or other types of neurological damage. <laughs> It's Friday, July 7th, 1995. Al, Brian, Ed, Terry, and Max are all co-workers at a photographic studio in North Carolina. Yes, all right. Enjoy hey, the stay good at the beach here, yeah. Golf is a sport they all love, as much for the camaraderie as the game itself. Oh, yeah, I hear you, Max. Yeah, sweet shot. Where in the world did you pull that one out of? Their golf games are highly competitive, and they usually prove a healthier option than the local bar. Oh, now, see, that's how you do it. Right. No. Max and Terry are old friends, and both are keen to win. As the group leaves the fifth tee, the skies begin to darken. It looks like rain. Yeah, it's getting cloudy. Looks like we might get wet. We're gonna be lucky to get them all in. Al, Brian, Ed, Terry, and Max decide to continue. What did I tell you guys? What did I say? It's gonna rain. On the green, the weather deteriorates rapidly. Max, will you hurry? A sudden downpour sends them running for shelter. Max just cannot resist finishing the hole. Got it. The only refuge is a wooden hut on the golf course. Max stands next to Terry in the doorway. Suddenly, lightning hits a nearby tree and the hut. Terry takes the full impact and dies instantly. How's he doing, Jack? Okay, he's breathing, but still unconscious. Ready? One, two, three. Max is severely injured. The others are in shock. What happened? Hey, hold on, man. You've been in an accident. Hang in there, Try to relax. When Max is told of Terry's death, his immediate reaction is that he's had a very lucky escape. But as he begins the process of recovery, the extent of his own injuries start to sink in. I found that I could put all the thoughts together to carry on a conversation, but sometimes the words just wouldn't come out. Then somebody said, well, don't you remember promising me that you do this and I said no and that's when my wife told me that yeah I'd been forgetting to do a lot of things and then I started to try and recall you know like my marriage and there were a lot of things that were just gone oh, yeah. Until recently, lightning victims in ER would only be treated for their physical injuries. Unfortunately, another injury has also occurred, and that's the one that we see long term. The damage to the nervous system that causes the personality changes, the memory difficulties, the difficulty processing new information. Those are all still physical damages that have been done to the nervous system even though we may class them as psychological it doesn't mean it's in the person's brain or person's head or that they've made it up he's walking he's talking he's he must be okay he's a bit irritable you know just give him a little bit of space he'll be all right and you know, oh, well, he forgot something, ah, ha, ha, ha. Again, people just don't understand just because I can walk and I can talk doesn't mean that I'm the same person that I was 250 milliseconds ago. Uh, I'm not the same person I was. 
they don't look like stroke patients. They don't look like uh, people who've uh, developed Alzheimer's disease. So it's subtle compared to those conditions, but it is a physical problem. That is, something's happened to the brain. The worst symptoms from the patient's point of view are the emotional ones. The feeling that they're not quite right, they can't manage, and they feel a great sense of loss. They feel incompetent, and that can be the most debilitating thing from the patient's point of view. If there's one thing I wish I could do would be to remember things, you know, to, to remember the, the, little the little moments in life, because uh, they're gone. Lightning is dangerous enough for those of us on the ground. But for people whose job takes them into the skies, the danger is even greater. Every civilian aircraft is struck by lightning on average twice a year. But for military aircraft flying in restricted air paths and at low altitudes, the strike rate is far higher. Normally, when lightning strikes an aircraft, the charge dissipates harmlessly through the metal skin, but not always. In the United States Air Force, the most sophisticated and powerful fighting force ever assembled, even the mighty F-16 fighter is not immune from this attack. Air National Guard pilots must fly a minimum of eight sorties a month to maintain their combat readiness. Their training missions involve practicing target bombing and dogfighting. In July 1989, Major Brian McLeod and Major Harry Gottschang of the 178th Fighter Group prepare for a routine training mission from their National Guard base in Springfield, Ohio. Two pilots take off in good weather and quickly assume their flight formation. They complete their mission and head back to base. Sabre 2221. Sabre 2221, how copy? Air traffic control radios Harry and Brian, warning them that a weather front is moving into the area, bringing a low cloud formation with it. The situation is changing rapidly. Sabre 2-1, be advised, we have a ceiling of uh, 800 feet. Tower Sabre 2-1, turning a five-mile uh, visual straight in. Sabre 2-1. The usual dual landing, where both planes land in tandem, is now out of the question. Both pilots must now break off from the formation and land their aircraft individually. Brian goes into land first. He splits from Harry and begins his final descent. Sabre 2-2, two Springfield Tower. Tower Sabre 2-2, two 10 mile out, ILS full stop. Suddenly, from out of the clouds, a bolt of lightning cuts through the sky and pierces Brian's cockpit, penetrating his shoulder. Brian's heart starts fibrillating. Sabre 2-2, two two, Springfield Tower. Sabre 2-2, two two, Springfield Tower. Air traffic control radios for confirmation of position, but Brian is too weak to respond. 
Barely conscious, he cries for help. Harry. Harry. Brian. Uh, the first inclination I had that there was a problem was when Brian called me on our auxiliary radio. Say again, Brian, this is Harry. What is your position off steer point five? Harry. I said, Brian, what's going on? No response. I then asked the air traffic controllers if they could give me a radar vector towards his position. Roger that. With the assistance of the air traffic controllers, then uh, I picked him up uh, just below the clouds, flying in a straight line, not turning left or right, and I made another radio call, and he did not respond. As I was approaching his aircraft, a bolt of lightning came out of the sky between my airplane and Brian's airplane and went straight to the ground. And I remember thinking very clearly at that point, this really isn't a very good place to be right now. I moved slightly forward of his wingtip and said on the radio, Brian, check your left wing. You can hear me nod your head. OK, good head nod. OK, Brian, fly on my wing. Fly on my wing, Brian. As Harry leads Brian back to the airbase, rescue crews are scrambled. No one is sure if Brian has enough strength left to land his aircraft. We got the air traffic controllers to give us a uh, turn back towards the base. When it came time to lower the landing gear, I looked over at Brian and said, are you ready to put the landing gear down? Stay on my wing. Stay on my wing, Brian. I'm going to take you to the approach end of the runway. When you're in a position to land, land your airplane. Struggling to control the aircraft, Brian begins his final approach. You got it? As his plane starts to touch down, Harry peels away from the runway. Go ahead and land. The plane touches down, but it's going too fast. On the brakes. Brian is too weak to apply the brakes. He's going to overshoot. Slow down. Ground crash seven, clear of one five three three, so I won't be able to cross. No call, we right. On the brakes. Get on the brakes, Brian. On the brakes. Slow her down. With no runway left and the rescue crews in pursuit, Brian summons all his strength. Slow her down. Finally, the aircraft starts to slow. Brian is taken to the hospital, where he made a full recovery. Today, Major Brian McLeod continues to fly for the United States Air Force Reserve. We have uh, fairly strict guidelines about avoiding thunderstorms altogether. Uh, there are times, in the case that Brian and I were flying, we really didn't expect lightning at that time. We weren't dealing with 45,000-foot uh, thunderstorms. This lightning was generated from something a lot less than that. Brian was unlucky. It's extremely rare for lightning to penetrate the protective metal skin of an aircraft. There's generally not much damage when an airplane gets struck because the outside of it is metal and the lightning just goes in one place and it flows through the metal skin and goes out someplace else. Even if lightning doesn't penetrate the interior of a plane, it can still prove extremely destructive. The metal casing of all military and commercial aircraft contains miles of wiring. When lightning strikes, the sudden surge of electrical current through the fuselage of the plane can cause that wiring to spark. This induces an electrical charge severe enough to give a sharp shock to anyone coming into contact with it. This may have happened to Brian. Sometimes there can be sparks in the fuel tank even. 
So nobody really knows because planes aren't tested against real lightning. Nobody knows how often there's sparks inside fuel tanks that if the mixture of the fuel were right would blow the wing off. And it may be that there's just a lot of luck involved in not losing more aircraft. Four minutes after taking off from Montreal in a driving storm, a Canadian four-engine jet plunged to earth and burned. All 100... 1963, a plane takes off from Montreal airport. A bolt of lightning strikes the aircraft's fuel tank. The plane explodes with 118 passengers on board. There are no survivors. About 20 miles north of its takeoff, in the same year, a jet flying from Puerto Rico to Philadelphia explodes in midair. 81 people are killed. The cause, lightning. And it is not just aircraft fuel tanks that are susceptible. When a bolt hits the Shell refinery in Woodbridge, New Jersey, the fire takes more than 48 hours to put out. The tank farm is supposed to have safeguards to protect it against lightning strikes, but in this case, Mother Nature's fury may have been too powerful. July 1984, the Texaco oil refinery in Milford Haven in Wales blows up. In one of the biggest industrial explosions on record, the shock waves are felt up to 30 miles away. Each day it burns, the company loses $400,000 worth of revenue. The culprit, lightning. The town of Jerunka, Egypt. A single bolt starts a fire in an oil refinery, which spreads rapidly to the nearby town and quickly gets out of control, destroying vehicles, homes and offices. The final death toll was over a hundred. Even a forest warmed by the sun can quickly become a natural tinderbox, as lethal in its own way as any oil refinery. In 1993, lightning strikes a tree on Storm King Mountain, Colorado. The fire spreads quickly. People are used to forest fires in these parts, but this one is different. Fanned by winds, it rapidly gets out of control. Desperate to save lives and property, a team of firefighters tries to fight back the flames. Twelve of them die in the attempt. Scientists cannot predict when or where lightning will strike, and we are only just beginning to understand the true nature of the lightning bolt itself. Most lightning on Earth comes out of the normal summer thunderstorms. The way the clouds get charged up, it's thought now is that rising small ice crystals collide with falling hail, and the interaction is like when you rub your foot across the rug in the winter. When the electrical charge builds to a sufficient level, the cloud starts to produce small sparks. These sparks start to move towards the ground in 150-foot bursts that are known as step leaders. With each burst, more electrical charge drains out of the cloud and into the front of the bolt. The more charge you get into this downward discharge, uh, the, the stronger the, the electric stress or electric fields at the nose of the thing is. So it sort of follows its nose. When it comes to within 150 feet of the ground, the negative charge in the nose of the lightning bolt attracts streams of positive ions from the Earth's surface and all the objects on it, including trees, buildings, and people. Now, it must strike. When one upward discharge meets one branch, that determines the path that the lightning is going to take to ground. And then all the charge in the leader is dumped through that one path, making the big current at the ground. 
and the very loud boom of the thunder you hear. The whole trip from the cloud to the ground takes maybe 20 or 30 thousandths of a second. Once lightning starts on its path towards the Earth's surface, it cannot be stopped. It must now strike. This can happen in a number of ways. It can hit the ground directly, forcing its current outwards from the point of impact. and the players have gone down on the pitch. In South Africa in November 1998, during a soccer match, nine players collapsed after receiving what is known as a ground current strike. So is Shabani, and that bolt of lightning was straight down onto the pitch here. We can feel it in our commentary box, which shuddered. When lightning hits the ground, its huge electrical charge spreads out from the strike point. If there is a person standing in the vicinity, the current will flow up one leg and down the other, rendering him unconscious. Well, we're going to have to see this game called off now by referee Montsamai. There's no way we can continue. Out of the blue, a bolt of lightning across the pitch. It's shut in here in the main stand, and it's affected all the players, and quite understandably, this game has been called off. All nine players eventually recovered and played in a rematch. Wonderful to see the camaraderie here. People are rarely killed by a ground current strike, but animals are. Animals very often get under trees, which get struck, and the current flows out along the ground. And since they have four legs, the lightning current goes up the front legs through their heart and then out the back legs, so it stops their heart. Another phenomenon which presents a danger to those standing in the vicinity of a lightning strike is known as side splash. Sunday's game with Georgia had just gotten underway when a bolt of lightning cascading from light pole to light pole struck Whitaker. Walking off the field and I was on the third base line and the next thing I know I heard a, a loud bang. The lightning strikes an object, in this case a pole, but senses there is a better conductor in the vicinity. It bounces from its initial target to a person standing nearby. This is because the water, which makes up 75% of the human body, will get the bolt to the ground faster than the pole. Normally, the sound of thunder and the sight of darkening skies warn us that lightning is about to strike. But the bolt which hit Brian Whitaker came without warning from what appeared to be a clear blue sky. The thunderclouds were 10 miles away. So how can we protect ourselves from attack? The best place is a, is a sturdy building, one that presumably has plumbing and wiring, and, and the building is actually grounded into the ground, not just laying on top of it. If you don't have any substantial building, go into a vehicle with a metal top. It's not a great place, but you will, you will survive a direct hit. Cars just been hit by lightning. There's no 100% uh, uh, safety against lightning. Even in a, in a house, people have been struck while taking a bath, uh, washing dishes, talking on the phone, watching TV, uh, working with electrical tools in the garage, that type of thing. So I would say if you're in a house, you should stay away from any connections to the outside. In Illinois, young Nathan Loyett was to discover this for himself. It was six o'clock on a Friday evening, and I was taking my twins to a birthday party. I left Nathan, who was 13 at the time, and Matthew, who was nine, and I told him I'd be back shortly to just lock the doors and you guys can stay home while I take them to the party. As I was gone, I guess I had only driven probably about a mile, and the sky just suddenly turned very green and very ominous looking. It was really scary, and I had never seen anything like that before. So I called him on my car phone, and Nathan answered. Hello? 
Yes, it is. I said, Nathan, get to the basement. It looks like there's going to be a tornado. I'll be home as quickly as I can, but take Matthew and go downstairs. He said, can I go in the garage and get the cats? Okay, but what about the I thought he just wanted to check on them and see if they were OK. He really meant he wanted to bring them in the house in the basement with him. OK, I'll try. I love you. Bye. Let's go. Mom says we've got to go in the basement now. Come on. But I don't want to go in the basement. But there's a storm coming, and Mom says we have to. I want to watch TV. We'll watch TV later. Let's go. Stop your grumbling. We have to do what mom says, so let's just do it. I'm getting tired of you, so you just sit right here while I go get the cat. Come here, Missy, Missy, Missy. Come here, Missy. Come here, Missy, Missy, Missy. Yes, good cat. lightning struck him through the doorknob. It traveled up his right arm, it went across his chest, and exited his left shoulder. He told Matthew to call 911. He said, I've just been electrocuted. So he, he dialed the number and then put Nathan on the phone and Nathan said he had been electrocuted. Hello, this is Nathan Lloyd. The operators that Special took the call said he kept saying, I'm on fire, call my mom. And my insides are burning. At first, I think they may have thought it was a prank phone call, um, but they did send an ambulance. I called the boys. Matthew answered the phone, and he said Nathan was electrocuted. He was struck by lightning. And I didn't believe him at the time because he didn't really sound upset or worried. He was just kind of normal Matt. And I said, well, let me talk to the paramedics. So Dave Barton got on the phone, who was a friend of ours. He said, Nathan appears to have been struck by lightning. We're going to the hospital. Just meet us there. They laid me down and started taking blood tests. And then they gave me x-rays and that. After the x-rays, all the burns started to go away. And it just, they all went away. And after that, everything was fine. While we were sitting in the emergency room, he was just kind of talking, chit-chatting, and he said, Mr. D was right. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean Mr. D was right? Mr. D was his sixth grade teacher that always had words of wisdom that he used to give the kids. And he said, Mr. D said that you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than winning the lottery. He goes, would you buy me some lottery tickets on the way home? He said, because maybe I'll win. The chances of being struck by lightning are one in 6,000. The chances of being hit twice are greater than one in three billion. A third strike should be a statistical impossibility. The day of my first strike was September 15, 1983. I worked in a preschool and I had been at work that morning. I got off about one o'clock and headed on to the post office to mail some parcels. I got there, it had been raining very hard in the morning, but it had stopped and it was looked like it was gonna start again. And I thought I better hurry up and go before the rain comes again. As I stepped across to step up onto the sidewalk, a blast came. At that point, I was knocked down, but I didn't realize it at the time. I felt myself falling, but I thought I had caught myself, and only later did I realize I did not catch myself, and I had been picked up and thrown to the concrete by the lightning. It was a terrible blast. I felt like somebody had thrown a hand grenade in my face. Uh, I knew I was hurt, but I didn't know how badly at the time. I went into the post, and when I got there, I thought, what am I doing here? I was becoming very disoriented. Came up to the counter, and the lady said to me, you know, can I help you? And I, I, uh, then I didn't even know why I was there. As the next couple of days went on, I began to be in a lot of pain, and I went in to see the doctor. Basically, what they told me at the end was that you have nerve ending damage and muscle damage, but all these things heal, and it takes a long time, and you just have to go home and heal. So I went home to heal. 
but the headaches did not go away. On May 27, 1993, I picked up the telephone in our townhouse. Our daughter was calling. She asked for her father, and at that moment, the first crack of lightning from a storm that was coming up off the ocean came through the telephone lines and hit me in the left side of my face. And I thought, oh God, not again. I can't live through this again. More than anything, I was afraid. I was afraid that all the work that I had done in 10 years to become a normal human being again, to get my memory back and to excel at anything was now going to be lost. I thought, what, what am I going to lose? What am I not going to remember? And that was the biggest thing was the memory loss. But fortunately, it didn't affect me as nearly as badly as the first time. I equate the first time to being run over by a Mack truck and the second time by being hit by like a bicycle. I thought I had left all that behind me. I was going on with my life. My husband and I moved to a new state. We moved to South Carolina. And I knew better than to touch water, but I, I just simply forgot. It was a memory lapse thing. I got up and went to the sink. And when I reached up to turn the faucets on, the lightning came through and ran up my arms. This time was different. This time I felt pain immediately. My arms felt like they were on fire. I, I heard this popping noise, which I thought was the light above my head breaking. I looked up, it did not. And I thought, what in the world is that noise? I looked around to see if anything had broken, it had not. And then I looked down at my arms. My arms looked like a werewolf's arms. The hair was standing up, my fingers were curled. They were burning, and I just thought, I've got, I've got to get cooled down. And I turned and went to my freezer, opened the top of my refrigerator into the freezer area, and leaned my upper body and my arms into the freezer. I've been struck three separate ways. I'm not the only person who's been struck multiple times. A forest ranger was struck eight times. He finally blew his brains out because he couldn't take the pain anymore. Despite the phenomenal odds against it, there are people who have been struck by lightning several times. Is it bad luck, simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time? There's been a couple of people who have been hit more than once. It's each case is an isolated, separate event. They just were in the wrong place more than once, since we have quite a few people who are uh, victims of lightning, inevitably somebody's going to be in the wrong place. But Dr. Hushang Hushmand of the Neurological Pain Center in Florida believes that being hit once makes a person more susceptible to being hit a second time. He uses an infrared camera to photograph his patient's body temperature. The hottest areas are red. In a healthy person, the red areas would be symmetrical. In the infrared photographs of Linda, they are asymmetrical. Dr. Hushman believes these asymmetrical red areas show where Linda was struck by lightning. The area that has been hit and the electricity has gone through the skin in that area, it has paralyzed the nerves in the wall of blood vessels in that area. So those blood vessels cannot constrict when they are exposed to cool weather. As a result, that area is hot compared to the surrounding area of the skin that's cold. This is just like a hole in the radiator, leaking the heat out, and the blood vessels that are normal surrounding it are compensating for it by keeping it cold. In these red areas, Hushman believes the skin's natural resistance to electrical charge has been greatly reduced. And this actually increases the likelihood that people who have been hit by lightning once will be struck again. Those areas of the body are, are like gates or open holes of no resistance of the skin, as if you are in a field of electromagnetic field, you're supposed to have your suit, a protective suit, and the suit has got a hole in it. Well, it goes right through that hole and kills you. Linda has been struck three times and survived. If Dr. Hushmand is right, her chances of being hit again are high. And Linda knows it. 
I'm very leery of it, I'm very afraid of it, and I'm very respectful of lightning. I don't intend to put myself in any kind of a situation where it might be attracted to me again. I, ex I plan to stay away from water, electricity, <laughs> telephones, televisions, boats, golf clubs, farming equipment, anything during any type of a gray cloud. It strikes out of the blue. It can kill, maim, and destroy. I'm absolutely terrified. Um, I've been reduced to trembling like a, like a scolded dog. Um, I'm absolutely petrified. No one is completely safe from lightning's lethal power. Our home has been struck on the outside. The phone lines have been struck three separate times coming into our house. Lightning knows no master and obeys only one rule, to find the path of least resistance to Earth. Anyone unlucky enough to be in its way can be permanently damaged. When I tell them I was struck by lightning, they say, well, you're lucky to be alive. And I say, well, lucky, you know, I was struck by lightning, you know, what are the chances of that happening? So, can't be all that lucky.